Hey, when I was a kid, I remember um, talking to my best friend about what our dads did at work, and we had no idea. I don't know if you were that way, or maybe you're a kid here today, or you still, <laughs> you don't know what your husband or your wife does at work. Um, there was an episode in The Wonder Years, uh, one of the most underrated television shows of all time, by the way. Anybody ever seen The Wonder Years? It's on Netflix, I'm told, kids, so you can watch it. But there was an episode where um, Kevin and his best friend Paul, I think, they're, I think they're on the bus, but they had the same thing. They're talking about what their fathers did, and they did not know what their dads did. And so the whole episode is then um, Kevin ends up going to work with his dad. And he understands then why his dad comes home frustrated, angry every night. In fact, at the end of the episode, it's really kind of funny. They both walk in because his dad had been reamed out by a supervisor. And um, he throws his coat down like he always did. And the rest of the family's always scared, nervous. He goes into the other room. Kevin walks in right behind him. He throws his, 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 uh, yeah, his jacket down. He walks on past because he's angry, right? Well, I think what happens is oftentimes we don't know what, can I say it, what our father is up to in these days. Today we're going to answer the question, is God at work? And if he is at work, what is he doing? What is he up to? Because I'm seeing a lot of Christians getting upset, mad about a lot of things that we should not be frustrated, upset about. And I'm going to uh, really offer this challenge as we see it. We see it in our church family. When we join God in what he's doing, we experience the great joy of life and find purpose and meaning in this life. Is God at work? What is he really up to in the world? We're going to talk about that because Revelation leads us all the way to the culmination of that and shows us what he's doing now. In fact, the annual report that, uh, that uh, Rodney referenced, I'm, I'm like him. It is amazing. Uh, and this year, saving a lot of money, by the way, on printing, you can go online and just track your way through it. You can spend a lot of time there. Um, I haven't even finished all of it. There's videos and all kinds of things that we can just rejoice and celebrate because we have joined God at work this year. And that's what this ministry report is all about. And it's what next Sunday will be about as we look at a ministry plan that guides our budget. That's what it is all about. And if you're a member of the church, come and rejoice with us as we celebrate all that God has done and all that he is going to do in the days ahead. We can affirm the good work our finance committee, staff, others have done as we have prepared this budget to the glory of God. Now, before I begin this message, I've got a couple of things I want to do. One is to recap a couple of things in this series. Part of the challenge of being a pastor uh, with multiple um, venues and, and places where we preach. A couple of weeks ago, uh, we preached a message. You know, we've, we've been walking through the series. Um, I've met some of you who are brand new today. Uh, is God, as you can see there, we've been asking questions. We started with, is God real? Does he even exist? You can go back and listen to these messages. We started with evidences for the existence of God. And then we talked about, is he, is he compassionate uh, last week? Is, is he really aware of what's going on? We talked about in the book of Ruth. Is he, is he really inclusive? Because we said one week he's exclusive. And then we came around the next week and said he's inclusive. We said, yes, he's both. That week we talked about inclusivity. There was much buzz, as there is in our culture today, about human sexuality. And we talked about how we're radically devoted to two things. We're radically devoted to holiness. And we are radically devoted to hospitality at the same time. This holiness idea plays into the message today. So I want to say this, just in, in terms of being a Christian, here's what it means. We receive the grace of God by faith, nothing we've done. And our response is to commit our lives, all of our preferences, all of our desires, all of our dreams, everything that we are, we bow before him and we lay them before the Lord Jesus Christ, the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. We give him our lives. We said one area of, of holiness is this idea of sexual purity. And so we've said that we are devoted to an orthodox, traditional, biblical, historical view of Christian sexuality. The Bible says we've been created male and female. Very clear. The Bible says that sexual intimacy is between one man and one woman. 
in the covenant relationship of marriage. We also said at the same time, we're all broken. We're all sinners. We're all sexually broken. Many of us have wrestled with shame and, and, shame and, and, and all kinds of struggles in our lives. And many of us still do. Many of us still wrestle with purity in terms of our sexuality. So many young people and others, not just young people, are addicted to pornography, among other things. We know that we all have fallen into sin. But we know, too, that there is grace for that. And we all are moving towards holiness. This is sanctification. Sanctus in the Latin. Becoming holy, which is to become just like Jesus. But here's the thing. We have said that the contrast of living holy lives is where the power of our witness comes from. We don't go along with culture. We don't say, well, that's new. Let's follow that. We are committed to the word of God and in every area of our lives. At the same time, we are committed, we, we, we are committed to hospitality. And here's what this means. We are inviting you to join us. Anyone can, can journey with us on this journey to holiness is what the Lord is calling us to. So you can come, you can lay your preferences and your desires and your dreams before the Lord and allow him to be Lord of your life. He then changes our desires as we journey with him. And the culmination of all of this, of course, is where all things are heading and we see it in the book of Revelation. Now, the book of Revelation is an interesting book, and it's hard to read. So I want to spend some time talking about this. What is God up to in the world? Here's what he's up to. He's making all things new. That's what he's doing. He's putting everything back together. I want this message to be an encouraging message for you. And here's what I would say. The Bible will never say what it never said. So I mean, you need to take notes on this sermon. You have, if you have your journal, you have Revelation 21, and I want you to think about this with me. Revelation was written, here's how I'd say it, for us, but it was not written to us. Now, don't let this throw you too much. Our first clue, this is true about the whole Bible, by the way. Our first clue is that the Bible has to be translated. You know this, right? It's not written to English-speaking people living in the global West. So we have to understand the context. We have to understand who were the original hearers. How did they receive the scriptures? Whatever book or passage we might be looking at. How did the first Christians receive the book of Revelation? They understood it. We struggle to because there's such a cultural historical leap. In part, it's because it's an, you know this, it's apocalyptic literature. This was an ancient Hebrew genre that we don't fully understand, and yet his first readers did. Now, I want to say this parenthetically. For about 200 years, we've adopted a brand new way to read Revelation, which is not found in historical theology. And many of us I'm sorry, sometimes the pastor has to put a little grain of sand in your heart and mind so that it might become a pearl of wisdom. I'm going to really mess with some of us because many of us have cut our, our, our teeth on this and we have only known a singular way to read Revelation. I grew up understanding a particular way which is a much more literal approach to the book of Revelation and that is not why it was written. Now, is it literally true? Yes. Is there figurative? And you know this, symbolic language? Yes. But there was, um, there's a dispensationalism. You probably have heard this, a dispensational view, mostly based on J.N. Darby, who was an English Bible teacher in the 1800s, came over to the United States and popularized a view that many adopted. And it became very much a now-centered, us-centered, right? A lot of people read Revelation and go, oh, that must be the United States. And, oh, wait, that's got to be Russia. And that's got to be this. If you look at it predictively, you're going you're gonna to read it that way. You're trying to predict who's what and who's where. Hal Lindsey, you might know that name, wrote a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. Anybody? Um, back in the day. Uh, there also, um, you, you might know the Left Behind series, Tim LaHaye, and, or maybe you've seen movies where, I mean, it will scare you to death. Uh, I remember as a student, 
watching some film that somebody put together and it's just scary stuff. Everybody's disappearing. And I remember thinking, my mom, dad can disappear. I'm not going to know what to do. I don't know. I mean, it, it's just, and, and, and friends, I'm just telling you, there's another way to read the book of Revelation. So much of what was popularized. And I would, I would lead you to, a uh, guide you to a podcast um, that I did when Hamas invaded Israel. Talked about this a bit because we all run to end times when anything like that happens. And I took a deep dive there that you can listen to. Uh, I point you to anything that N.T. Wright has written on eschatology and the kingdom of God. A book by Daniel Hummel that is called The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism. Um, where he talks about how it it is now uh, hopefully being, being redirected in a way that the book was actually written. Because many of us have come to understand or tried to figure out all the symbols, and there's a lot of people, they're making money, and they, they want to help you understand what all of these things mean. These metaphors, the beast, what is the dragon? John's Old Testament, ours, clearly points out that the dragon is Satan. We know who the dragon is. There's all the talk of Antichrist, which is not even mentioned in the book of Revelation. By the way, there's a corroboration of all kinds of verses and texts and such. Daniel, in particular, yes, is legitimate. We find es eschatological writings there that come into play. All of the verse readers and hearers would have been looking through the lens of the Old Testament. Hebrews who knew the scriptures and they read this and they would have known exactly what he's talking about. It's written in this kind of figurative language so that those who don't need to pick it up and read it would understand. And they would not understand. But if we read it predictively or only in terms of future orientation, we're going to miss the power and ironically the relevance of the book. And I hope that you'll discover some of that today. So we know this. Revelation was written by John the Apostle. Uh, for, on the Isle of, uh, of Patmos, he's in exile. Why is he in exile? Because Christians across the Roman Empire, about 90 AD, under the rule of dimension as emperor, are being persecuted, oppressed, uh, severely brutal persecution is taking place among Christians. This is important to understand. As we read it, the entire book is written to encourage Christians who are being persecuted. Now, we don't face the kind of persecution that they did by any means. Praise be to God. As Rodney noted, on this weekend and tomorrow, we celebrate those who've given the price of their lives for our freedom. And even this morning, I was thinking, how many people are just not even going to worship the Lord today? In America, of all places, when we have the freedom to do so, we take it for granted. And we are here because God has allowed us the freedom in our country to do. I've been to places around the world where people cannot do that. And we have partners in other places and they are worshiping with courage, yet hiding out to worship God Almighty. And here we are. Do not take it for granted today, friends. But the Bible teaches us here in the book of Revelation that the dragon, who is Satan, <laughs> is behind the power behind Babylon. And Babylon ends up being any empire throughout all of history and all who are to come. This is the thing about eschatological literature. It was true when they first read it and applied it. It is true now in our time, and it will be true to come. This is a story of Team Jesus. Okay, here it is. The Lamb and Team Satan who represents Babylon. And they're in opposition to one another. So the, the disciple must understand and be discerning about all that is wrong, be discerning about the disruption and the evil taking place in the world, and could it be even in the church. And so in, a, in another great book called Revelation for the Rest of Us, Scott McKnight writes this. Revelation is about the Lamb's final, complete defeat of the dragon and its Babylons in the establishment of New Jerusalem. This is what we come to in, in chapter 21. Conformity to the world, friends, is the problem. And this book tells us that discipleship requires a resistance to the world and 
in any time, in any era, up against Babylon. Now, I'm going to talk about three identities, three storylines in the days to come. In fact, we're going to gather again together here, our entire church family, on June the 30th. And I'm going to dive deeper into this. But for a moment, I just want to offer three identities that we're going to see that apply to us in our day. And I think more than any time in my lifetime. The first one is that we are beloved yet dissonant disciples. We are fully loved by God. We extend grace to all. And yet we live as dissident, subversive agents in the world. What do, you, what do I mean? Love is our superpower. And so we do not live in the way of Babylon, but radical love that changes the world. That's the way of Jesus. The second identity or storyline that we're living out, we are hopeful yet resistant exiles. The image of exile must be adopted by us because it has always been the identity of God's people. Now, many of us know of the exile when they're sent out. You think of Daniel uh, and his friends. But even before that, think about this. We have always been exiles. Abraham was to bring forth a nation that would be unlike any other nation. In what way? Holy and consecrated before the Lord. And then comes, yes, the law that's given to God's people. You're to live like this. And it will separate you from every other nation on the planet. You will have no other gods but one God. God's people have always been exiles in the world. And we now as Christians, we become now the new Israel. We are now following the perfect Israelite, Jesus, who fulfilled the law. We now live lives of worship that look radically different than the rest of the world. True worship, friends, listen. True worship is our witness every single day. And as we have this interesting intersection of worshiping God with everything we've got, while at the same time resisting Babylon with everything we've got, we live as light in the world. This is the way of Jesus. Jesus' kingdom is more than just a mere spiritual abstraction. It is real and he has called us to it, yet it's, it wasn't revolutionary and it wasn't violent. In fact, he would nonviolently crush the kingdoms of this world by being crushed by Rome itself. He would absorb our sin upon himself. This is the way of the cross. We are to live as exiles while living in Babylon. That's what this book really is about. It's the way of the cross. And so Babylon represents any empire. It's, it's, it's opulent. It is indulgent. Any empire. Think of, think of the Egyptians, God's people, Assyrians, the Babylonians. We, we think of Persia. We think of the Roman empire. And we could keep on going. Babylon is any empire that is anti-God, it is murderous, it's militaristic, it's economically exploitative, it's arrogant, it's self-adulation is the reason that it exists. And it is the way of the dragon. And it's the way of Babylon. This represents Babylon. So with this context, I want you to see this. Three things that we'll see in this passage. Don't have time to cover the whole chapter, um, but we'll highlight some things along the way. Revelation 21 shows us that God, three things, God is comforting us, God is preparing us, and God is protecting us. Okay, first, I want you to see God is comforting us. Again, John is writing to a group of Christians, and he's writing, this is the power of the word of God, he's writing to us to encourage us, even in the midst of intense persecution for those early believers. Chapter 1, I mean, chapter 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. So, wait, is it heaven or is it earth? Yes. Heaven and earth now converge as one. This is Christ's prayer in the Lord's Prayer. Heaven, where God's will is done perfectly, now converges and comes to earth. Noteworthy, all of history is headed to heaven and earth being united together forever. Look at verse 2. This is what God's up to in the world. I saw the holy city, 
New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride. Wait, is it a city or is it a bride? Yes. See, these multiple images actually help give us different perspectives on the same thing. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, look, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Now notice the new, this isn't worthy of of notice. New Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven. This is not God scooping up a bunch of people and, and taking them off to some celestial place where we have disembodied spirits or we're floating around on clouds like angels. There are angels, there are humans who receive their resurrected bodies in this time and they are coming down with him. You say, Jeff, do you believe in a rapture? Yes, I believe this is it. I believe when Christ comes again, it's closing time. We will be changed in an instant and heaven and earth will come together. Earth, the new earth, completely restored. Heaven is going to look a lot like earth than most of us imagine. On a beautiful day like this, it is a foretaste of what is to come. We're going to know each other. We're going to be serving the Lord. Someone told me, well, only the worship leader is actually going to have a job in heaven because we're just going to be singing for thousands of years. Now, some of you who don't sing are like, that, that'd be my nightmare. Is that what? Are we just going to sing like all the time? We're going to do some sing. Hey, in heaven, you'll have a great voice. You'll be able to sing to the Lord or it won't matter. No, how about this? We'll all hear you perfectly in tune perfectly in pitch but but we're going to be active we're going to be worshiping him doing the things that we love the most in a blink of an eye look at this in verse four it was read earlier he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more look at this the land of no more neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away friends this is comforting because this is happening now It's already the trajectory of all that's happening in all of our grief, all of our mourning and pain, the former things. This is what we're experiencing. These are the former things. And as I've noted with with the Peterson family and and, and with with Pike, one of his favorite songs, the hymn of heaven. Understand that Paul is with our students this morning as they have come together with Brad Schwal talking, our students talking about grief and hope that we have in Christ because their friend Pike has passed away. Friends, we're on this side of the land of no more, but he is here to comfort us. And this is where all of history is heading. Look at verse five. And he who is seated on the throne, behold, I am making all things new. And he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He, and he said to me, it is done. Now, this is not the word that you might know to tell us die. It is finished. This means this word's a different word. It means it has come into being. All that has been promised is now here. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning of end and the end. All things come together. And in Jesus' words, straight out of John 7, this is Jesus again, to the thirsty, I will give from the spring of water uh, of life without payment. The grace that comes to us, the one who is faithful will have this heritage. But look, it goes on. The one who's cowardly, faithless, the detestable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, adult idolaters, all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. And this is the second death. It is destined to die for every person to die once and face judgment. Either eternity on the new earth or eternity apart from God. People say, Jeff, do you believe in a literal hell where there's actually flames and fire and we're burning up for eternity? I say, well, I think that's figuratively, it's it's metaphorical. Oh, good, because that sounds horrible. No, no, no. It's much worse than that. It's much worse than that in ways we can't fathom. Again, this is the kind of, that's the best the writer could do. How about burning up all the time? Can you imagine that? eternal then punishment apart from God. God is at work right now and he's at work through us. 
The question, here it is, is God at work? It's not even a question when you see the church on the move with God. When we go to work with God, then we see him at work. We don't have a question. Is he at work? Is he at work in your life? Have you joined him in what he's doing? He's restoring all things. See, we can mourn with those who mourn. We can be the present, the presence that wipes away the tears of those who are hurting. We can be the one who serves the poor or who brings justice to the oppressed. We can be about what he's about right now. And this is what our ministry report is all about. And this is what our plans forward are all about. How can we join God in what he's doing in the world? This is why our young people are going to be in Guatemala. We've got groups again going to South Texas. Some came back just this past week. Our middle schoolers are going to be in Mission Arlington. We're going to be in South Dallas and a million other places. Wherever you might go this summer, you are doing the work of God and what is to come. Because what's next is now as we live for him now. So he's comforting us. He's preparing us. Look at verse nine. Then came one of the seven angels who had seven bowls full of the seven last plagues. These have all already been articulated through the book of Revelation and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Now, this is really interesting, really helpful. The one, okay, came one of the seven angels. So this one angel is going to show him, okay, going to show him again what's happening. And look at what he's showing him. He's showing him the bride, the wife of the lamb. Who is this? The bride is his church. He shows us the new Jerusalem. Now take note of this. We, again, we want to read it literally. Wait, the new Jerusalem, what does it look like? How big is it? How, how, what are the, how does it, can we measure it? What, does it look, what am I going to Do I have a mansion? What's my room going to look like? We want to run there with all the physical stuff. When in actuality, it's, it's more figurative and metaphorical and more beautiful than we can imagine. But what's happening here, look at this. The city is made up of people. It's not a city. Like, what does this city look like? There's some of that. But it's like Dallas. You might love Dallas. I love Dallas. But I don't just mean like I love the Mavericks. Come on, let's go. Um, or the stars but, or buildings downtown. I love the streets. I lo no, I love the people, right? It's the same way of the church. I could say, I love this sanctuary. <laughs> This is the most unique, beautiful place in Dallas, I could argue. Maybe because so many great things have happened in this room. I love the church, but I'm talking about the people of the church, right? That's what he's saying here. Don't miss this. So the new Jerusalem, we're talking about people who are coming. And then John is getting to see and now show us this picture of Christ us, the bride, fully adorned, fully realized in him. This is a beautiful picture of who we are becoming. Verse 11 says, we have become the radiance of the glory of God. We are like a rare jewel, Jasper. We have these 12 gates and 12 angels and 12 tribes and 12 apostles of the land. What is this? We have this foundation of all of the past that's brought together. We have gates that are open in all directions. Okay, then verses 15 through 19, again, not time to unpack all this. We see this detail of the measurements of this beautiful city. And again, we want to take it literally. If we took this literally, this is a beautiful cube and it's 1,400 miles square cube. Now, his original readers would have, would have known exactly what this is. This is the cube just like the holy of holies. But it's not small. It's not a little tabernacle you carry around the desert. It's not just a, a little plot of land in Jerusalem. This is heaven, a place that can hold all people from every tribe and nation, everyone who has received him as the lamb who was slain and have given their lives to him. And then the images here, are representative of priestly garb. Don't miss this. Again, we don't have time to dive into all, but the elements of the temple are here. I mean, what are we talking about? This is 12 
12 apostles, 12 tribes, all these jewels and such. This is what the priest would put on to wear to go into the Holy of Holies. Now we, the church, are wearing the beauty of God's grace and his forgiveness covering us. We now sanctified, being sanctified, being made holy, can step into the Holy of Holies where the Lamb of God has, has rent the, the curtain into so that we can come into the Holy of Holies. He's sanctifying us right now and he is preparing us for this moment. And he's doing it right now. Not only is he comforting us, he, he is, he's preparing us and finally he is protecting us. I want you to see something that's fascinating. fascinating. Well, again, if we understood biblical history, like the first hearers, you have the garden. You could argue the temple, God's presence with Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall. Then what happens is we have then the, uh, the, the coming of the law, okay? And the building of the, of the tabernacle, the presence of God. Then the building of the temple, the exact location of the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. Then Christ comes, the exact location of God in the flesh, in the person of Jesus, then he sends his spirit, he says, will come. The spirit of God comes and dwells in us, which is why Paul says, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. His spirit is in us, living in us right now. This is why I say what's next is now. As we give our lives to him and live for him, we advance the kingdom of God. As we live in obedience to him, our witness is in the contrast of our holy lives. And he is not only now comforting us, he is preparing us and he is protecting us. Look at this. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Lord Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need for sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and its lamp is the lamb friends we are in the presence of god almighty and there's now no need for light because the glory of god is shining upon us there is no separation between us and god i think this is why john says earlier there's no sea he's out on the isle of patmos there is no separation by its light will the nations walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it he's saying from all over the world those who claim or thought they had power or all that is beautiful and great from all the nations will come to him and, and, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no more night there. If you are in Christ, listen, you are secure. You don't, know, you don't have to worry about being lost about being forgotten, abandoned, pushed away. You don't have to be scared of the dark because there is no dark. And as we walk in the light, even now, we have the truth of God's word in us and the power of his spirit, friends. This is why we can live as exiles with courage and with resistance as holy saints before God and before people all around us. Jesus said in John 17, there, there's nothing that has been lost with those who have been taken into his hands. Nothing will be lost. He says, no one can snatch them out of my hand. We are secure in him. And in Christ, if you are in him, you will endure. You will persevere. And there is nothing and there is no one or no thing that can separate you from the love of God. And you need to hold on to that today. He is protecting us. Look at verse 16, I mean 26. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Everything beautiful will come to him. All nations will come. Every tribe and tongue will ultimately proclaim him as Lord of all. This is where all of history is heading. And this is what's happening right now. This is how God is at work in the world. He's putting everything back together. 
He's given us a new heart. He's given us a new mind, as we read in our dwell reading this week out of 1 Corinthians. He's given us a new purpose in life. But friends, don't miss this. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And if you've not received Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have settled that. Your name is not written in the book of life. And this storyline goes in a very different way. Is God at work in the world? How would you know? Go to work with him. That's how you know. And you experience the joy and purpose as a beloved disciple, as a hopeful exile, and as a selfless servant, as we live for him. And one day, one day, we'll see him face to face. And we will rejoice in his presence. Amen. Lord God, we love you and we praise you for this beautiful image that you've given to us, a picture of what is to come and what is now. So Lord, I pray that we will rest on the truth that you are Lord of all. I pray that we'll give our lives fully to you. I pray those of us who have not been at work with you will join the workforce and we will celebrate through our giving, through our our relationships through leading and discipling our children, our young people, and each other. Lord, we thank you for the story of Vinod that we have seen today. And we know that you're at work transforming all of us by the power of your grace. Friend, I want to ask you, is your name written in the, in the Lamb's Book of Life? You can receive him now. By faith, say yes. Lord, I give you my life. I give you all that I am. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. And now I commit to live a holy life in obedience to you until the day I die and see you face to face. And Lord, collectively as a church, we pray for the Peterson family and so many who are grieving and for those who know and remember those who've lost their lives for our freedom. We thank you for the comfort you bring for how you're preparing us, you're protecting us. We give you our lives anew. In Christ's name, amen.